Hey guys, how's it going? Um, so tonight we have four incredible speakers talking to you about their keys to success. Uh, each one of them has a wealth of knowledge and experience across a myriad of topics. And I can't wait to hear the insight they share with all of us tonight. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker, Leisha Muraki. Leisha heralds from Seattle and arrived in Melbourne with the Hello Poster show five years ago. It was it five years ago? Six years ago? Five, cool. Uh, since then, she has cemented her into the design industry through a myriad of projects. She is one of the directors of Sex, Drugs and Helvetica, a lecturer at RMIT, one of the founders of Uncoated, and has been on the Agda Council for many years. And then she freelances in all her free time. Uh, she is passionate and motivated and is the perfect example of how hard work and determination pays off. So please put your hands together for Leisha. Hello. Um, all right, thanks for coming. I'm going to put my glasses on because I can't see. Um, all right, so uh, my name is Leisha, and I'm just going to get right into it. Um, so I split my professional life into three areas. The first one being a designer. Uh, hello? Oh, that makes such a difference, doesn't it? <laughs> It's like you couldn't hear me, and then you could hear me. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, so yes, I split my time between three areas, and one of them is being a designer. So this image here is of a publication, um, a print solution, but I also work in print and in digital. Um, I used to do a lot of typography and branding, but now I spend most of my time doing publications and information design for data visualization, which basically means that companies come to me and give me large sets of data, <coughs> and I'm creating graphs um, or information design based on that, based on that data. Uh, I'm a sometimes educator, uh, most often at RMIT, teaching professional practice, <laughs> professional development, um, but I also have taught at a few TAFEs and private colleges. And the other area is being a director um, of a company called Uncoded. And its most public facing product <laughs> is Sex, Drugs, and Helvetica, which is a conference and an online site where my main role would be not so much as a design practitioner, so I'm not executing any <laughs> print pieces, but it's very much design strategy. Um, I'm wearing many hats, event logistics, marketing, account managing. So keys to success. I've got one key, which is very helpful because I only have 10 minutes, apparently. So one key. Um, so that works out really well for me. Um, the key to success. It is learning how to build relationships. That is it. That is the key to everything. Um, it's certainly something that is a key in your personal life and in your professional life, but of course I'm going to just talk about the professional part. Um, so when I say building relationships, um, I guess there's an assumption that to build a relationship you need to know how to start it and how to maintain it. And the way to do that is communicating uh, listening and understanding. So as a designer, how am I building relationships? Okay, so within my design life, I work with boutique clients. So those to me are companies with smaller budgets. So those are your kind of cafes or your fashion labels. And then I have more corporate associations, organizations, not-for-profits. Um, a corporate client might be um, PwC, whereas a association uh, might be, for me, I, I've worked with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or the United Nations AIDS Foundation. But regardless of it, if it's a boutique or a corporate client, um, it's very much the same relationship that I have with these clients. So it's understanding their needs, communicating the best strategy. In the case of me being a designer, I, I am the expert, and, I, and it's my job to communicate uh, the best strategy for them, and then <laughs> also communicating the client's overall vis vision. I am a communication designer, and so you have to communicate the design vision. 
So that was client side, but when we're looking at um, actual design solutions, um, this is my, my process. Um, so even though there's been a, a growth in tech and in digital, I'm still designing for humans. There's still a human element at the end of the day. And so uh, because there's a, a, a person at the end, um, human interaction is very much at the core of the design process. Um, this would be called human-centered design. So we have sort of five steps. I mean, this is very much prescribed. Are there more than five? Of course there are more than five. But um, to make it simple, there are five um, areas. Um, the first one is this empathize, and this is what I want to touch on. Um, starting the process, you have to empathize with your, <coughs> your user or your potential client. And this, is again, is building this relationship with your potential user. So you're, you need to communicate, and you need to ask questions. You have to listen to what they have to say, and you have to watch what they do. Um, and then from there, you can start uh, going through the other steps of the design process. So once you start um, understanding the user, then you can create a, a problem statement or a question. So let's just say that the problem question, or you're defining the question. Um, for example, it might be, how might we get from point A to point B more, efficient, more efficiently? And then from there, you start having a lot of ideas and a lot of sketches on how we could get from point A to point B more efficiently. Maybe it's an app, maybe it's a site, maybe it's holding hands, like whatever it is, you start having a number of ideas and you're going back and forth, again, building relationships with with your users to see what works and what doesn't, and eventually get to a point where you can prototype and you can test, but always, and this is, I'm gonna say it over and over again, um, communicating um, and really understanding your user in that relationship. Um, eventually you get to a point where you have an ideal solution, whether that's a print solution or a digital solution or whatever solution that is, and then you're sending it in to the market where the relationship you have with users is <coughs> equally important. So that sort of leads me into my role as a director. So the company that I that I run is called Uncoded, and it's very much a startup, entrepreneurial startup. Um, but as I mentioned, the two main public-facing products are Sex, Drugs, and Helvetica, which is the conference. So what that is, is a one-day conference. We ask six speakers, international, national, local speakers, to each speak about one project. They go in-depth about this project and giving practical knowledge, very insightful. They go from you know, how they got the client to the emails back and forth, to the invoicing, to the actual process of designing, the execution. And then probably for me, the most important is um, the, fin the finished product and, and what the public and the users had to say and how they measure its success. So it's definitely not a portfolio review. It is um, a practical conference. Um, I have slipped in the dates for this year, <laughs> just, you know, FYI. So we do it in Melbourne and in Brisbane. Um, the other one is we have an online site, uh, sexdragshelvetica.com. We started with the conference and we've built these relationships with the speakers and the attendees, but we wanted a way to, to continue those conversations. And so the online site certainly helps. We sort of take in that, those, those practical elements and um, we have a number of articles that sort of speak to those topics. Um, ah, okay. <laughs> um, so there are four of us who run this company. There's Nick, there's Zach, there's me, and then there's Andy. Um, so I wanted to discuss, I guess, the building of a relationship within our own business. Um, this is a business canvas model. It's something that I show to a lot of my students. Um, this is a good way to audit a business. In general, it's a, it's a, a blueprint um, if you're interested in even starting your own business. Um, but I'm only going to talk about like these, these four uh, areas here. So the first one is... Um, the value prop. 
So for us, the what do you do, the value proposition is that we create, curate, and publish design content through our Sex, Drugs, and Helvetica conference and website. Our ongoing mission is to help designers become better problem solvers, become more informed, more mindful, and more engaged. And that's the goal for us, problem solving. It's for us being a better designer is being a better problem solver because that is what designers do. The goal, obviously, is to communicate this value proposition or this unique selling point to our audience. And this goes back, again, to the communication part. So how do we communicate? Um, so we communicate through transparency and trust and definitely approachability. I'd like to think that I'm quite approachable. Like, I'm kind of nice. <laughs> like, maybe you'd want to come and talk to me afterward. Um, but that's. I think these are the three areas that help us build relationships with, with people in this room or with the speakers or with potential partners um, or people we've never met before. Um, these are really important traits. We are transparent to a fault, probably. When we fuck up, we tell everyone that we fucked up um, because that's how you build trust. Um, and we've definitely had that in our business before, but I'm 100% I'm sure that more people respect us for that. <coughs> Um, so how do we reach them? What are our distribution channels? So I've put down <laughs> drinking the wines and the beers. Um, that's a funny way of saying there was a time, I guess, when business was done with a handshake. And I do think that that notion holds true in some aspects now, regardless of whether you have a digital product or not, or there's not a lot of human interaction. But I think relationships are made stronger through networking through things like this when you're actually speaking to someone. Um, but of course there are other channels that we go through and that's advertising. We do other events besides our conference, like we do a master class as well and sometimes I'm giving guest lectures at um, different uh, education providers. And then social media of course and then written content on our, on our site. Okay, so what do we need? What are our key resources in order to make this happen? Um, we need humans, that helps. <laughs> and I need my Mac laptop, that's very helpful for me as well. Um, humans, so we're very lucky that, that from the start people have believed in our vision. Um, we have, so that again there's four of us as directors and then we have an editor, a couple of writers, photographers uh, and videographers that help us get through um, our company. Um, we also need a lot of time, which everyone has the same amount of time, um, and also mental bandwidth. Um, regardless if you have time, if my head is elsewhere, if I'm thinking about my design projects or my clients or te teaching, I'll just robotic over here, um, teaching, then I don't have the mental bandwidth to do this job, so that's really important as well. Um, just quickly, the core team, again, we are all part-time on this job. This is not a full-time role for us. We all have other areas that we're working in. Nick is a user experience and user interface designer. He runs a digital consultancy called Joan. Uh, he's also the founding, a founder of a not-for-profit called Positive Posters. Um, Zach is a senior designer for a very large, large company. Um, there's myself, um, designer and educator, which I've mentioned. And um, and then there's Andy, who's the uh, who's an artist, an amazing watercolor artist and image maker. Um, our day to day, this is the very practical part. Our day to day is spent um, using applications called uh, Basecamp and Slack. So Basecamp looks like this, and we use this to communicate um, because we don't have a, a, st a studio, we don't have an office, we work remotely. So a lot of our conversations happen through Basecamp. Basically, there are different modules. I'm being told to speed up, so my I'm speaking faster. Um, different modules, and within each module, there are discussions. And then there is a tool that we use called Slack. This sort of replaces the the day-to-day -day banter that you might have if you were in a studio. Um, it's like it's like uh, texting, but on an online platform. Um, and then you can categorize each of them, but it's very, very helpful for the business. Um, we also do a Google Hangout every Tuesday um, at 7 p.m. <laughs> and then we do an in-person sort of once a month. Um, 
we do we we try to stick to this because we're also friends. The four of us are friends, and we try to separate our friendship and our and our business. And so we're p quite scheduled and prescribed to this. Um, we also do a dir direction of company once a quarter, so we're discussing where we want our company to grow. I think that's very important um, to continue to communicate and maintain the relationship within your own business. Um, and this last point, and I'm going to end. Um, oh, I'm almost finished. Um, the individual pursuits, and that's something that I found is not common with a lot of businesses, where the directors or the employees are actually having conversations with each other to discuss what you want to do in your own life, um, and that's so important. Um, so we do that once a quarter. We just did that a couple of weeks ago, which was really good um, because we're all we're, the four of us are different people. And we're wanting different things, and so it's so important that we maintain that relationship and those conversations. So there's no resentment. Um, so when I say learning how to build relationships, it's also really important to sort of build yourself to maintain the relationship that you have with yourself. It's probably easy to overlook that you're a person that <laughs> has things that they want as well. Um, so just remembering to constantly com communicate your own interests and to understand that those interests are going to change. And just as an example for me, you know, I started in Seattle, and and then I moved here to Rome, and then I was so, so sure that I was going to end up here, and then all of a sudden I was here, and I don't even know how it happened. Like six months here became now five years. And so just, I guess my point is, as if you can remember to to think about what you want in your life and to equally maintain that relationship with your, yourself, you're probably going to have a better time or an easier time in maintaining relationships with the people around you. And you can start sort of defining what your own success is because it's always going to be different. What um, my success is is different from yours. But I still feel that building relationships is very much at the, at the core of defining that. And I'm yet to define it. And I hope I will along the way. But um, definitely the communication and the listening and understanding is so important to build a company and to, to be successful in, in, in any avenue. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Leisha. So our second speaker this evening is Jackie Vidal. Nearly five years ago, Jackie opened a limited edition print shop in Paran called Signed and Numbered. One year later, that tiny print store had outgrown its location and moved to a bigger space. Then another year passed and she opened her second store in DeGrave Street, just down that way. You need to go check it out. Uh, constantly supporting artists in the creative community, Jackie is an inspiration to anyone who wants to show that you can make money from doing what you love. Please welcome Jackie. Hey. Okay, a bit of a disclaimer. I haven't actually done any public speaking since year eight, which was debate. <laughs> so I've got no clue how this is going to go. Um, but firstly, success. It's actually a really hard topic to stand up here and talk about because really what Toby is asking, what Redbubble is asking us to do is stand up here and talk about how successful we are. So I feel like a bit of a dick to start off with. Um, but do you know, what is success? Is it money? Is it, you know, doing something you love? Is it pu public recognition? Is it being asked to speak at engagements like this? Um, success is so many different things. So this little speech, whatever this is up here, um, it's going to be very personal to what success is for me. Um, I know what success is to me. It's to waking up in the morning and going yeah, I get to go to work today and I might not jump out of bed every day and, you know, die to get to work, but I certainly love what I do. And I think that's, that's what success means to me, is loving what you do. So how do you find out what you love? So I own Signed and Numbered. So I came up with this concept, this concept about six years ago when I was travelling around Paris for a little print shop that, it was like an art gallery, but wasn't an art gallery. It was actually more like a record store. So this is my store in Greville Street. That's part of my store in the city. 
So this is how we're set up. So we're set up like a record store. Um, so there's smaller prints up top, medium-sized prints underneath, and what you can't see behind that is the large print displays. Okay, and this is my second business, which probably none of you knew about. But last spring, I launched another business called Ivy Muse with a girlfriend of mine. So I'm a co-founder of it. And we're a botanical wear studio. So it's basically a fancy way of saying that we make and fabricate things to do with plants. So plant stands, pots, basically anything botanical. It comes, it comes into it later on, so. Okay, so first of all, you just gotta wing it. I'm standing up here right now winging it because I was supposed to have these slides to you like a week and a half ago and I only got them to Toby about two days ago and I literally didn't think past the individual words on the slide until I caught the train here and wrote some notes. So just winging it. You know, the timing's never going to be right. No matter what you do in life, it's never going to be the right time to do something. You're never going to have enough money. You're never going to feel secure enough. You're never going to feel like the time is right to start this new venture. Sometimes you just got to do it. I had my concerns about starting up Sign and Numbered. Number one was that I'd never actually been to an art gallery. I didn't actually know any artists. Um, I was so outside of the industry that I didn't even actually know that there was an industry to begin with. Um, sometimes you've just got to take that leap of faith and close your eyes and trust in your vision. And for me, that's what it was. I had a vision of a little record store. And I'll tell you how I came about it. It was basically I was in the markets. When I was living over in London, I went over to Paris for the weekend. And it was those little markets along the banks of the river. And it was all those touristy sort of like photos of the Seine and all those main tourist attractions, and they're all cellophaned. And I really liked the feeling of flipping through something and handling it. It was a very tactile experience. Um, and I just thought, wouldn't it be great if it wasn't all really crappy touristy photos? Wouldn't it be great if it was something that I actually wanted to buy because I did want to buy something. I wanted, really wanted to invest my money so I could take home a memory of an experience I had in this beautiful city. But there was nothing I wanted to buy, so that got me thinking, well, what do I want to buy? Well, it's probably some artwork that's cool, maybe street art or illustration, um, something that's affordable. So that's what Signed and Numbered is. It's creating an experience. It's not so much selling people a piece of artwork or print. It's about people taking something away from the shop because they want to remember their experience in the shop. Okay, is there anything else down here? Okay. So nobody, know, nobody knows what they're doing. Um, <laughs> you know, you sometimes from the outside looking in, you look at companies or you look at people and you think they've got their shit together, they know so much, are they doing so well? They don't know what they're doing. Nobody knows what they're doing. And the more time I spend with people that I admire and I still admire them so much, but I realise that I'm no different from them. Nobody knows what they're doing. Everyone is just winging it. Like, that's it. Okay, but also just a little disclaimer, don't wing the small stuff because that stuff's not going to get done. Like fast statements, online updates, you can't wing that sort of stuff. You've got to do it. So that applies more to like bigger picture stuff. Okay, attitude and outlook. So I think a lot of this is sort of already in you as you grow up. I think your parents are a big influence. So my mum was, my mum is a lawyer, a solicitor. She was a partner in a law firm. She was ducks of her class at Melbourne Uni, um, very sort of corporate. My dad was a Polish-Russian immigrant, always worked for himself, always called my mum a pan pusher, um, very sort of like a self-made man. So I grew up stuck between these two very different people with very different perspectives but that what they had in common was that they loved to travel. And I think that really made me naturally curious. And I think that's been the key to my success in that everywhere I look, I'm naturally curious about things. I look for opportunities. I look for gaps in the market. Um, and I think you need to approach things with that sort of hunger. You need to seek out opportunity. Um, 
So basically, I've told you how I came about the idea for Signed and Numbered. So my other business, Ivy Me, is the plant stands. So <laughs> basically, we used to sell some plant stands in the gallery because I love having green stuff around, like green stuff there. It just makes people feel more welcomed. It creates a nicer environment. And the plant stands that we were selling were really nice, but half of them, when they arrived, they were just spray painted. They were arriving damaged. So I just thought, you know what? I can do this and I can do it better. I had no experience in fabricating anything at all. But, you know, you just got to constantly look around. It doesn't matter if you've got no experience in the area because sometimes you've just got to trust your gut. So, <laughs> intuition. People think that it's a really sort of airy-fairy thing. It's not. Um, basically, what I think intuition is or trusting your gut is or gut instinct, it's basically all your experiences and all your memories um, that are inside of you. And when you have a gut feeling, that's just your body processing that so fast that it's not telling you in words, it's telling you in a feeling. Um, and you have to listen to that. And actually, I rarely ask other people for their opinion on things because I know that if they do have a different opinion, that I'm not going to listen to it anyway. What I like to do is just trust my gut. So when we opened up the second store in DeGrave Street, I didn't really, like, you know, I didn't do a business model. I didn't sit down and do the figures about, you know, how much we have to sell to make the store profitable. Um, I simply went in there and I closed my eyes and I stood there and I just asked myself, does this feel right? And it felt right, so I signed the lease. Um, and that's how I operate in business. Probably doesn't work for everyone, but you've got to trust yourself. Um, okay, flipping it. Turning negatives into positives. So I've touched on this already. That I really had no clue what I was doing when I opened up Signed and Numbered. And I had no clue what I was doing when I was opening up sign, um, Ivy Muse. But, you know, sometimes you just got to take a negative and make it into a positive. I honestly, I don't think that sign a number would have been successful if I'd started it and already had been in the industry. I think the fact that I knew nothing and didn't know what I was doing really worked to my advantage because I didn't look at the space as a white cube and go, okay, well, let's put something on the wall there, something on the wall there. I looked at it with no industry experience and thought, you know what, this is what I'm going to do and I don't care that nobody's done it like this before. Um, this is the way that I want to do it. This is the way I see it when I close my eyes. Um, and I think that's been a real positive in that. I lost my mic, no. Um, into turning a negative into a positive. Don't sweat the small stuff. So this is a big one, especially for anyone going out there and starting a business. First year is going to be really, really hard. Um, luckily, when I was painting the shop, when we opened up, signed and numbered, the very first one in Gravel Street, I actually found out I was pregnant that week. So for that first year, I actually had really big happy hormones going on. So nothing got to me. But I probably would have had a mental breakdown if I wasn't pregnant. Um, because there was days where you'd be sitting in the shop all day and you'd sell a card. You'd sell $6. And that, that's really depressing. Um, but what it's taught me is that you can't sweat the small stuff. You've got to look at the bigger picture. Um, and <laughs> I'm really good at handling that now. I wasn't. You know, there used to be days where, you know, something that we're posting over to Berlin for a customer order, you know, maybe it got damaged in the post or it got lost. And I used to lose sleep over that. And now I don't lose sleep over that. And the only trick is to actually sweat it at the start and sort of know how to respond and sweat the small stuff so much that you don't care. Yeah. Stay hungry. So basically you've always got to change in business. Um, Toby mentioned, so we originally opened up on Gravel Street, but we were in a much smaller space around the corner on Izzard Street. Um, we only stayed there for a year because the shop that I wanted originally came up for lease. Um, and despite probably not being financially ready to move out of that smaller space, I sort of knew it was the right thing and I knew that we needed that bigger space to reach our potential. Um, so I went for it. And then... In the bigger space, we decided to add the Just Another Project 
space in the back, which was great. Um, and then that sort of, you know, the new, new bigger space and like all that was going on kept me sort of interested for a while. And then it really became about opening up the second shop. And this year it's about workshops and my new business, Ivy Muse. So you've got to stay hungry. You've got to stay ahead of the competition um, because someone will always try and compete with you, which is great and it's absolutely fine. But you can't ever wake up and just feel like what you've done is enough. You've constantly got to be changing, adding things, evolving. Um, so you've got to have the right attitude for that. I mean, I love that. I don't want to do the same thing every day. I want to offer people new artists, new prints, new experiences in store. Okay, so I'll leave you for quote. So I just read this the other day on the plane down to Tasmania in a really good book by Lisa Messenger. Um, so it says, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? So it's by Marianne Williamson. So it's like you've got to give yourself permission to be successful. You know, a lot of people feel like they don't deserve it or they can't be successful. And I tell you one thing, it's like everyone around you can tell you that you can do it, but unless you believe that you can do it, you're not going to do anything. You know, that has to come from inside. You've got to give your, yourself permission to be successful. And a lot of people talk about the fear of failure. So I don't even think the fear of failure is an issue. People fail and fail and fail. It's about fear of success. People are crippled by the fear that they might actually achieve something in life. So I think sometimes you just got to say, yes, I can do it. I can be successful. I can stand up here and give this speech about, well, you know, the keys to success. Um, so, yeah, just give yourself the permission um, and just know that you can do it and trust your gut. That's my speech. So our next speaker is Luke Giuliani, an entrepreneur who started numerous projects and businesses across several industries. These include Square Weave, a web company making the world better with technology, Grace, a cafe in Fitzroy, right near Rose Street Markets, yeah? Yep. Check it out. Um, Alce, a social enter enterprise, sorry, connecting citizens with decision makers and the Fitzroy Academy of Getting Shit Done. That is not a fake name, it's real. I watched a video today, it was awesome. Um, that was a project teaching people how to work on ideas that don't even exist yet. He brings a wealth of knowledge and experience here to us tonight. So please welcome Luke. Thanks. Um, the Fitzroy Academy of Getting Shit Done, we had a bit of a problem actually. Um, the government, you know those big evil guys, won't let you register a business name with a swear word in it. So you ha we had to... <laughs> that was our reaction. It was crazy. Um, so we had to register Fitzroy GSD, which we were very sad about. But... Um, I'm going to tell you some things tonight. That's me. It's actually the same jacket too. I'm even matching. You recognise me, right? Because <laughs> don't worry, I tell don't tell all bad jokes. They're mostly bad. Okay, cool. I'm going to start. I got four main tips that I want to run through with you guys today. Sorry, I walk around a lot. I'm sorry, camera guys. You're going to be really angry. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll see how I go. Okay, cool. So do some maths. Um, so this is often one of the things that stops people early on. They're scared to just throw some numbers on a page. You don't have to really stick to them necessarily is the funny trick. You just got to have a go because it really helps you understand kind of the parameters around what you're doing, you know. What do you, how much do you need to sell and is that reasonable? Do you want to pay yourself? Do you want this to be a hobby or a business? And when you do the maths, kind of add 20%, right, because you're crap at maths. I'm crap at maths. I like, I got an engineering degree and I'm crap at maths, right? So throw 20% on them. and Yeah, exactly. Um, I don't know how I passed. Um, so throw 20% on them. And it just gives you that kind of confidence area. Maybe it rains all winter and no one goes into the print shop. You know, maybe um, a typhoon comes and that's also rain, which makes it a really crappy second example. Anyway, I'm going to keep going. Um, so the, we're really bad about being objective about money. And so this also helps when you start working with a business partner because it gives you some stuff to look at on the page and say, this is the thing we're talking about instead of saying, this is the thing we're talking about. And you get to point at a thing on a piece of paper and talk to that instead of talk to each other, which can sometimes be much harder. 
Um, on the being clear with your partners is really really important when you start. When I started Square Weave, which was the first business I started, sort of. Um, Will and I drew up a contract. Now this is the most hilarious contract you ever saw. Neither of us had done any law, and it says things like um, Luke will do um, code and run the servers, and Will will make the studio pretty and do design. And that's what the contract said. It said we'll keep five hundred dollars in the bank as a minimum, and every month we'll take out ten percent each. It meant that at the end of the first month, neither of us said to each other, hey, can I have some money? <laughs> can I get paid, please? Because we'd already agreed on it up front, and it meant that we were talking to something external instead of at each other about who needed money or however that might work. We framed it. Years later, we found it. The actual printout where we signed it and everything, it's like two pages long, and we framed it. It's in a studio. It's hilarious. Uh, I would never do that now. But it's a great way to start. Right, it's a really good way to start because it's not meant to stand up in court, but it is meant to solidify out what you both understand as your engagement with each other. All right, so that's my first one. Do some maths at twenty percent. Number two, get the right people around you. So people are just so crucial to the stuff that you do, whether they're business partners or mentors or employees or friends or partners or whatever it might be. Um, they're just so important. Um. The, the thing that I always try and go back to is there's probably someone out there who's better at the thing you're trying to do right now. There's probably someone else who's better at that. The inverse of this is that there's probably something that you're really freaking good at that is the core of what you're trying to do. So identify the thing you're really freaking good at and do that. Everything else, you want to be trying to get to the point where you can get someone else to do that for you because you don't want to do it anyway. You know how happy I was when I had a bookkeeper? Bookkeeping is crap. That is the worst job ever. But when you pay someone else, like, yeah, I, now I can concentrate on doing this thing over here that I'm actually pretty good at. Um, the, the corollary to this is that culture is king. And as you start to employ people or work with more and more people, you want to be really clear about what kind of culture you want to foster inside your organization or your, your startup or your business or your solo project even. What kind of cultural, relationally, cultural relationship do you want to have with your clients? with your suppliers, with your whoever that you're working with, you know? Do you want to talk in business tones and be business things and wear suits and all this kind of... Or do you want to be really chilled out and go get plastered every Friday? Yeah, that one? Yeah, cool. Well, you know, and that's fine. And if you understand that, that's really important to how your, your project will evolve and behave. Um, there's a cultural thing we have at Square Wave, which was, uh, is... The, the manual, and basically the way it worked was, look, you should always ask questions, right? You ask questions, and actually when you have a question and you ask me, because I kind of own the company, I'm not going to just tell you the answer. We're going to get everyone to sit down together and we're going to figure out the best answer, and it might, may or may not be what I think. Often, more and more, it's not, because I'm figuring out that I don't know shit, so I don't know why I'm here. But anyway, um, you write down the answer, and you write it down somewhere that everyone has access to. And so now everyone can access the answer, so you're not asking the question again and again and again and again. And the important thing about this is it's a nice little trick to do as you have more people, but culturally it became really important. So people would ask a question and say, well, uh, is it in the manual? I went and looked. It's not in the manual. This is a disaster. Where's the big red button I get to push that makes the blinding lights? What? I heard the answer to this last week, and it's not in the manual. So you build these cultural things that support the progr progress of your project or organization. When in doubt, persist. This is an interesting one. I see lots of projects that are freaking amazing projects and invariably they hit rough seas because every project hits rough seas. And you really do have to persist. I, one of my um, businesses is a cafe and I strongly believe that hospitality workers work harder than anybody else. Absolutely anybody else. They do longer hours, they deal with more people, they have to deal with more crap. The crap of the world is put in their face every day. They have great times too. Like some of the best experiences I've had is when I've worked hospitality. But they work so freaking hard, right? Next time you go sit in a cafe, watch how hard they work. You've got to work that hard. You've got to work hospitality hard. And, that, and persisting is a big bit of that. you just got to like, you know what? That customer just yelled at you down the phone. You've got to hang up that phone, go outside, scream at the world, come back inside and keep going and take the next call and the next one and the next one. Um, I, I did a project a long time ago called FutureSpark, and FutureSpark was a concert powered by bikes and solar panels. And um, when we were thinking about FutureSpark, I was working with um, my mentor, 
and he was kind of driving the project a bit and I was kind of doing all the doingy stuff. And about two months into the project, sorry, I like to drink while I'm talking. Oh, that's better. Two months into the project, the GFC hit, and that was the end of the world. Um, and this project didn't have very much money because it was a ridiculous project to run a concert powered by bikes and solar panels. And every time I went to him and I said, is this project still going or what? And he would say, I don't even understand why you're asking the question. Of course it's still going. Like, we are going with this 100%. And that meant it happened. Because without that constant um, push of, yes, of course it's happening, of course it's happening, of course it's happening. I don't care if the world's actually ending and it's not some pansy little GFC. We are still going to do this concert. It's still going to be freaking amazing. It's still going to be powered by solar panels and bikes. So what do we have to do to make that happen? And there's a lot of value in that, not just for yourself, but also for the people around you. When you stand up every day and, you know, the hail's coming down, you say, yeah, we're still having the concert outside. It's going to be great. Party, yeah. You know, that it drives people. It really encourages people. Don't do concerts outside. It's bad. Um, okay, cool. Last one. Treat people with love. This is so important. And I think, you know, I read a, there was an article that did the rounds a little while ago, and it was the a complaint, essentially, about this, this phrase of, well, that's business. It's like, that's shit. That is just such a shit phrase. I hate that phrase so much. Like, you should never just be like, that's business. You should treat people with love. They're people, you know. They're your staff. They're your bosses. They're your coworkers. They're your husbands or wives. They're, they're, they're around you, and they, they need to be treated with love. I want you to... Actually, at the start of this evening, we had an expression of love, was the acknowledgement of country. And it often gets glossed over in events where it's like, and we know it's and it goes really fast, and you're like, oh shit, I'm glad we got that done. But actually, that's a really interesting expression of love. You're actually saying, actually, we need to convey our love to the people that were here before us. And they're not here. So I'm sorry if there's any Indigenous people in the audience. I don't mean to offend, but I didn't see any. But, you know, that's a really interesting expression of love, like conveying that to people who aren't even here. What I want you to do for 10 seconds, I think I'm going okay for time. So, yeah, good, okay. Turn to the person next to you. If you came to that person, don't turn to them. Turn to someone else. I want you to tell them your name, your favorite place to go to relax, and your favorite flavor of ice cream. And you need to do it in 10 seconds each because this is a 10-minute talk, which is about a tenth of the time I normally have. Go. Okay, go the other way around, other person, quick. All right, your 10 seconds are up, that's it. Zip. Zip. Treating? <laughs> really, the, the main reason I did that was so I could have another sip of beer, so no. Um, the first thing to treat someone with love, you need to really listen. It's the first thing. You need to really listen. I'm a bit of a, a sad fight club lover, you know, from my teenage years. I loved that movie. And it's, it's the line goes, really listening instead of waiting for your turn to speak. And the exercise was really freaking rushed because I don't have much time. But I hope that you really listened and listened to where their favorite spot to relax was, which was the one in the middle. Maybe next time you want to relax, you can try that spot. Maybe you can send them a Twitter or something and send them an email and say, hey, I, 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 took, I did your spot. It was really good. <laughs> took, took it. It's my spot now. Maybe you can go have ice cream together. But I hope you listened and I hope you really took that on board and thought, and you can think later about, or you can not, I don't mind. You can, but when you talk to someone, you're like, oh, I wonder why they like chocolate ice cream. Was it because they love chocolate as a kid? Are they just like Messina, like total fanatics, and all they eat is the crazy one that's on the top of the blackboard? I wonder why. And you can start to really think about things in terms of why people are doing and thinking and saying things. Um, so a few other things. Relationships are king, and I think someone else made this point before, and it's so true, and it starts with listening. Always take a coffee. I will always take a coffee. If you email me and say, hey, Luke, saw you speak, 
or didn't see you speak, saw you on Twitter, let's go grab a coffee. I will always take a coffee because you never know the stories that someone's going to bring. If I'm really busy, I might be a bastard and say, come to me, it's half an hour, I'm sorry, I'm really busy, but I will always take a coffee and I, I encourage you to do it too. The amount of times you build amazing relationships, they're not necessarily business ones, but even life ones, just from taking a coffee, it's the best. You can always do or a tea. I'll have hot. I'll have tea if you want. We used to say in Square, fifty percent of web development is therapy, and it's so true. It's the same kind of thing. If you're in a space where you're dealing with people who don't understand what you do, then half of your job is therapy. Half of your job is getting them across the line of understanding what you're at. But actually, more importantly, you helping them with that, and you helping them with that journey. Um. My wife and I, we have date nights. And it's just as important part in your personal life to treat the people in your personal life with love as the ones in your business life. Date nights are the best, by the way. You get to go do cool stuff or watch a movie at home. Oh, it's great. I don't know why you wouldn't do it. All right, cool. Um, th there's one really interesting point about this, and I'm really cognizant that I'm talking about lovey-dovey, soppy crap in a like, success of a business kind of talk. And it's it's really hard because if I try and give you the reason why you should treat people with love and it's because later on it'll come back and they'll give you something and then you win. You've missed the point. You really have. And as soon as you start analyzing it like that, it's not going to work for you anymore. If you do this, if you treat the world with love, it makes the world a better place for all of us. And that's enough. Thank you. Okay, so Steve Ledbeater is our last but certainly not least speaker for tonight. He is a Melbourne-based artist and designer that communicates through a mixture of traditional and digital media. His quirky illustrations and fun type has the ability to brighten anyone's day. So please put your hands together for Steve. Firstly... Thank you to Redbubble for inviting me to speak this evening and to Jackie and Leisha and Luke for their intimidatingly good speeches, so making me lucky last or unlucky as the case may be and thanks to all you beautiful people in attendance. But before you trust my ideas on success, perhaps you need to know a little bit about who I am. I may not be as world famous as others. Apparently, Melbourne-based artist graphic designer Steve Ledbetter sees beauty and mystery in the everyday. He explores his narrow suburban experience with broad appeal and dark humour, often employing typographic form and the most basic of materials. Regardless of discipline, his intention remains to inspire others to think, feel, and even to act differently, something he seems to achieve with remarkable ease. He also writes in third person for credibility. <laughs> now, so... Or perhaps this is another way to sum myself up very quickly. <laughs> now that we're sufficiently introduced and I'm comfortable with you guys, I want to talk about success. And we've heard today that it's many different things to different people. But I'm going to talk about what it means to me. And that is a way to approach creative projects and a creative life that's enjoyable, rewarding and sustainable. To do this, I've identified five stages of art. Now, these are universal and these come from years of experience in the design industry. They come from conversations with fellow artists. It comes from books I've read and of course it comes from my own experience. And they are to be inspired, to do what you love, to do it often, to communicate with others or connect with others and in turn to inspire them. And these are what I'm going to cover today as quickly as I can. To be inspired. This is the energy that you have at the start of a job or the start of anything that when you open yourself up to something, you get that energy and that excitement about possibilities and that energy is what you keep with you for the whole journey. So it's very important to be inspired. Let the world fill you up. There's Everything's inspirational. A lot of people walk around because we get so much of it, they kind of are immune to it. But just be wild, be free, broaden your view on things. Closer or further away? If people up the back can hear me, drink, drink booze, listen to punk rock, turn up to 11. Drink coffee, drink coffee with booze. Just do whatever you need to do. Travel, 
have fun and explore and open up. This is a time if, when you're doing this, you need to open up. And after you've done all this activity, sleep is actually underrated. Apart from the physical aspect of rest, and it's important to your routine, the energy you get from that, and not to mention the subconscious is a very deep well of creativity in itself. And if you can tap into that, then you're doing better than most of us. I'm surrounded by upside down books. I'm surrounded by books at home and at work, none of which I've finished. They're all, I just skim through them, pick what I need and keep inspired. I've got an inspiration drawer full of bits and pieces I've found. I've got an inspiration wall that watches me as I work. That's always changing. And of course, I'm inspired by some of the greatest artists in the world that have ever lived, in my opinion, and some ones that you've probably never heard of. And that seems pretty obvious, but that's probably what makes it believable and what makes it true. I also get a lot of value out of knowing a little bit about where the work has come from, the people behind the work, the context that the work was made in. I think that's very important. But one thing you should never do is underestimate the power of the people that are in your life, the people that you have a connection with and experience with, because that makes you understand what it is to be human and what you're doing as an artist is connecting with other people through your art. And it's absolutely a part of art, it has to be. And knowing people and understanding them is key to that. So any of the words here that you see are inspirational to me in some way. The point of this is it's everywhere. Great book on this is Still Like an Artist by Austin Cleon, a book I have actually finished. Stage two, I just point out that these stages don't have to happen in this order. This is just a natural progression of order. Do what you love. So with all this inspiration, you might feel overwhelmed. You've got too much inspiration. How do I navigate through this? maze of inspiration, well, there's a very easy way, thankfully, and that is to do what you love. Be guided by that. Do not do what you think others will like. You will have failed twice. They won't like it. You won't like it. Don't go there. If it feels right, it usually is. And if you're on a path that you love, things will just keep naturally falling into place. And as I think Jackie pointed out, what you love now will naturally lead to what you love in the future. So don't worry about what you should love, what you used to love, what you're embarrassed to love. Just go with it and you'll be fine. I love lots of things. As you can see here, I love to draw, I love to illustrate. And this is something that I've done ever since I was a kid and I'll continue to do. It's a natural thing. <laughs> can you hear me up the back when I talk like this? You can lip read, I can tell, but... Oh yeah, video. And I also love to express myself in a in more intangible way when I'm painting with pure emotions and <coughs> painting in an abstract way. From my years as a designer, I've got a deep love of typography and I still explore that. Photography is something that I constantly do. I'm addicted to it. I'll keep doing it. The more I do it, the better or the easier it is for me. You can see there's so many different ways you can express what you like. Sometimes I strip away all the aesthetics and I just <coughs> communicate as clearly as I can with a direct message. And I find that really refreshing sometimes in art because sometimes it can become too contrived. A great book on this is War of Art. If this doesn't get you moving, then nothing will. Next stage, do it often. This is one of the most important aspects. They're all important, but this one is often overlooked. It's about frequency and... I believe that it's the best way to get good at what you do. It's the best and easiest way to continue doing what you do and for more of it to naturally come to you. Rather than taking each laboursome fortnightly step, it'll become like walking. You just, just take another step. You don't think about it. You do it regularly. Ideas come in. You keep walking. It makes sense. Do not stagnate and dip in when you can, when you feel like it, when you're in the mood. Just keep going and it'll all fall into place naturally. And this is where you own your craft, where you get good at being you, where you refine your skill <coughs> and you should respect yourself and your passion by scheduling regular creative time, whether it's, it doesn't have to be seven o'clock every night, I spend an hour, it can be once a day I spend ten minutes, it can be ten minutes here and there, just make it regular, the more often the better and respect where you work. My wife's in the audience and she knows that what I work doesn't look like this anymore, it's like a bomb of books and shit, but that's how it should look. You should have respect. I also always have 
Google Docs on my phone. I have a little notepad. I'm always writing something down. Always keep it with you. And you'll be surprised once you start writing things down. More ideas come and it keeps on filling up to the point now where I've got so many ideas backlogged that I just have to choose one. When it's like time to make some shit, we'll just pick one of these that I've ticked earlier. There's, it'll keep coming. Great book on this about building your routine. I'll give you guys a book list afterwards. <laughs> Connect with others. It's very important as an artist, I believe, to realise that it's not done in isolation. You need to connect with other people, not just buyers and not just viewers, but in the process of making your artwork. When you love, you have to share. That makes sense. The, uh, the, the internet's leveled the playing field in a lot of ways. It used to be, I need money, I need fame, I need fortune, I need all these things to get going in a gallery. You don't need that anymore. You can get online and build a profile quite easily. And Redbubble, interestingly, facilitates the entire process. You can, you can get feedback when you like, you can, you can have, you can explore inspiration from other people, you can share the process behind your work, you can show your work, you can reach an audience, you can sell your work, you can be inspired by other people's work and they can be inspired by yours. This whole big cycle, so interesting point. And do not subscribe to the lonely, starving artist myth. It is just that, it's a myth. Does anyone really believe that you need to be a self-hating intellectual to make art of any importance. I think people talk about art reflecting life. And if it's truly to do so, why can't it reflect people that are well-adjusted and happy? I'm not one of those people, but it should be able to, right? <laughs> this, you need to collaborate with people from the start. Don't wait till the end or till you're good. Collaborate whenever you like. You're allowed to be happy. Liberate yourself from this stupid notion and elevate your work. I'm always sharing what I'm doing, whether it's what I'm seeing, this is all Instagram junk, but it shows where I am, what I'm thinking about, what I see, how I see things, and I share that. Red Bubble, I share my process of the way I'm creating my work, and I share the product of that. It's important sometimes to show the process of your work. You look at this and go, okay, so he can spell three words in a script font, but no, it's a vector illustration of an earlier pencil sketch. And knowing this gives this more weight. So showing a bit about what you do isn't a bad thing. Show your work, another one by Mr. Cleon. Lastly, to in, is to inspire them. I think it's one thing to do your artwork, to be good at it, but you're, and you've connected with people, but now you need to deepen that connection for it to be of worth, I think, or I feel. It completes a very natural cycle. They need a story. Every art needs a story. No one has a picture on their wall where they just go, yeah, it looks cool. They go, I bought this while I was overseas, or I met the artist, or it reminds me of something, or it's a reprint of something I had before. There's always a story. It doesn't have to be a big, deep one. It just has to be a story. And you should give your audience that, because it allows them to connect with you and your work. And if it doesn't have it, show them and if your process is honest and visible, it'll obviously take care of itself. And these people will become advocates of you and your work. And not in a I give, I get way, like that Luke was pointing out, it's just what should happen. When I'm working, I'm often thinking about what can inspire people. Even if it's a small amount, not inspire them like, I'm gonna do some new stuff because Steve had some artwork. It's more a little bit of a difference if you laugh. Even la making someone laugh, is changing a thought very subtly. I think it's important to do that. And sometimes it's not even your work that inspires people. I mean, if a 40-year-old from Melbourne's eastern suburbs can make stuff with scraps of paper <laughs> and, some, and some ink, then it's safe for everyone, right? <laughs> and when people ask you, how long did that take? How do, you how do you find the time? Where do you start? And all this kind of thing. They're interested in you or your work in some way, and that means you're getting through. So you know it's working if you hear these questions, and you will. An example of a deeper meaning is right here. When you see this, it's some brushed, it's some brushed type on a black background. When I see this, it's the voice of my 14-year-old daughter telling me, Dad, sometimes when something good doesn't happen, it's because something better is going to happen. So for me, her, her little, little pep talk to me is right there. And for me, I love this. And it's got nothing to do with the way it looks. And it's an example of why you should 
make sure people understand something more about your work than merely aesthetics. Sometimes I inspire myself, sum up my whole life in one drawing, or remind myself of something I absolutely believe. A great book on this, oddly titled Why People Fail, the section on uh, purpose is really good. So, if success is a way to approach creative projects and a creative life that's enjoyable, rewarding and sustainable, I believe that if you're truly inspired, if you're doing what you love, you made that a habit, you're connecting with other people and you're inspiring them, you will be truly successful. And you've got a really good chance of being happy as well, which is a nice bonus. And I'll leave you with uh, a thought from a very influential philosopher. And if you can't remember five things, remember one, and it's this. Making art is like life. Enjoy it and connect with others, or it's a waste of time. Thank you for listening. Connect with me, and I'll share the book list and some inspirational blogs. I really appreciate your time and coming out on a Wednesday night and make sure that if you didn't get one of these, you do. Thank you.